we're so glad to have all of you here. This learning and listening event is co-hosted by the JEDI Collaborative and Food Funded, an event series sponsored by Slow Money and New Hope's Escabona platform. Both JEDI and Food Funded were founded over the past several years to support the action needed to create a more just, equitable, diverse, and include, inclusive food system. Given that these hosting organizations come from a legacy of predominantly white leadership, this event is all about amplifying black leadership voices and providing a listening and learning opportunity for the broader community. And again, we are so grateful to have all of you here today. Long-term systemic change in support of the Black Lives Movement and racial and social justice requires committed allies and representative leadership, which both Food Funded and the JEDI Collaborative are committed to supporting and accelerating. We are very aware that racial equity and JEDI go beyond the Black community. So while this event features Black voices, we will be hosting more events and conversations in the near future addressing other communities of color, including Latinx and Indigenous people. And with that, let's move on to our program. Systemic racism in the food world starts with and is fueled by economic injustice. So we must look at where capital flows and who and what gets funded. And that is the topic for today. Our learning will begin with our keynote speakers who are focused on addressing the role money plays in systemic racism. So please join me in welcoming Kelly Carlisle, the founder and executive director of the Urban Youth Farm Project, Acta Nonverba, and Rodney Foxworth, CEO of Common Future. And we will start with Rodney. Well, thanks for the wonderful introduction. I am eager to be in conversation with Kelly in particular. We had a uh, very um, lively uh, prep conversation um, in anticipation for the day. And so one of the things I just want to get us um, framed up for is the question around whether or not we live in a system that is in fact broken. I think there's always conversation that we need to fix this broken system. Um, and I in particular believe that the system was designed to do exactly what it's doing. Um, and so that means for those of us, particularly who are in communities of color, come from communities of color, um, and other uh, communities that have been deeply impacted by economic injustice, um, the results that we see on a day-to-day -day basis um, that are actually rendered more visible for many, many people now today than what we've actually experienced um, since the beginning. Um, it's really important for us to recognize that that was all an intentional design. And so, you know, can you fix something that was actually intentionally uh, developed to, in fact, uh, impact uh, marginalized communities in this way? And so, at my organization, Common Future, and with the network that we have, we talk a lot about how do we create new systems uh, within the existing, uh, existing system and build something that's al an alternative. And so, you know, with that, I really want to have a conversation with Kelly um, because I think the, the discussion that we had uh, the other day was really lively and it really kind of touched on some of the, the lived experiences that leaders of color in particular, um, African-American, Indigenous, Latinx, others, experience on a day-to-day -day basis that really sort of implicate the existing system that we have today. Uh, and so would love to just uh, be in conversation with Kelly at this point and actually kick off a conversation with her, particularly around one of the things that we discussed um, on a prep call, which was even in thinking about how organizations have to be particularly of a certain size even to be recognized by the current system when we think about um, investors and philanthropy um, and with that how that implicates organizations that are led by folks like kelly and so we'd love to get uh, kelly's response to that hi okay great thank you um, <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for um, that wonderful introduction. Hi, Kai. Um, we, uh, we did have a wonderful conversation, Rodney, and I, I was really struck by your analysis on power and, and redistribution and the system. I think 
so I'm the founder and executive director of Act Non Verba Youth Urban Farm Project. Um, we work with kids age five to 15, primarily in East Oakland, uh, to run three farms in the city of Oakland. The kids plan, plant, harvest, and sell the produce that we grow, and 100% of that profit goes into individual savings accounts that can only be used for educational purposes. Um, we're 10 years old this year, and, you know, when we, we, we finally got to a, a place where it wasn't just trying to make ourselves a household name and, you know, be a resource to the community that they knew that they could turn to. We finally got into a place where we can sit back and analyze our impact and, and think about power and how it affects um, our children and our families and, and what that means in terms of money. So we, um, we, just recently decided to um, focus in on wealth building and bridging the the, the uh, wealth gap um, through these savings accounts. We say that they're for educational purposes, but what we discover every day is um, that we have to first start with giving our kids a sense of agency and a sense of um, a sense that they're worth it, right? That there is something more in the future, that there is something bigger and brighter and broader than, than maybe what they've seen so far. Um, and so I, I'd love to know more about how your work is shifting capital, Rodney, and, and what that looks like for, you know, adults that are doing this work, um, as opposed to trying to remind kids that they have a voice and that they, this is their money. Um, please. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. I think that um, one of the, the things that we talk a lot about within my organization is the idea of shifting capital to shift power. And I think this is really where we, when we have conversations about, you know, investment, philanthropy. Um, those are all opportunities for people to hoard power. Um, wealth and power go hand in hand, um, particularly in, in this, in this uh, context. And so we really look toward how do we best position leaders in our network who at this point are majority of folks of color um, made up of individuals in communities that have historically been either uh, explicitly exploited and extracted from um, or have been marginalized or disregarded completely. And, and, and what I mean by they've been disregarded, um, I'm really speaking to the existing power dynamic, the existing system. And in fact, we know that in these communities, you know, I come from, I'm from West Baltimore. Um, Baltimore is a city that is one that is consistently looked at as sort of a failing city. Um, and, and that's because of the systems. It's because of anti-Black racism. It's because of uh, over-policing, mass incarceration. And yet within these communities, we know that there's so much brilliance and activity that's happening. And so what we try to do is recognize that where there is, is really a power gap. There's a power gap. There's not like an intellectual gap. There's not a talent gap. There's actually a power gap. And so one of the things we think about when we talk in terms of shifting capital is really doing it in a way that we can actually enable greater power building uh, for communities. And, and so that's sort of the perspective that we hold as an organization. And one of the things that we've done over the past, you know, several months in light of COVID-19 and light of movement for Black Lives is really be able to trust in those relationships that we have with our network and be able to invest in a way, and when I say invest, holistically, philanthropically, and also with some catalytic investments um, that really is about ensuring that folks in our network are able to build their own wealth, so not accumulating wealth for investors or other wealth holders or even common future, but actually building the capacity and opportunity for a community wealth building approach and really kind of seeding that through our own resources. That is really to me, a definition of like, how do you begin to shift power a bit um, and give people an opportunity to have actual tangible resources that are at their disposal, that are theirs to self-determine in ways that um, historically, and again, I say historically, but it's happening day to day, every day, um, that um, does not enable for communities to actually have the type of voice that they deserve. Um, the communities that I come from um, that have been ignored and not heard. And so, that is something that we think about a lot in our organization. Um, there's so much more unpacking for us to be able to do, but 
I think about Kelly, when we had that conversation, you know, we were able to support um, a number of black led institutions in our network um, uh, about a month ago. And we would get these questions from investors and philanthropists about how we were able to do that. And quite frankly, it was because we just trusted our folks, right? We, we understood their inherent ability and capabilities. And so that is something that's very distinct from the existing system, which is actually all about, particularly folks who look like us, constantly having to prove ourselves to those who do not look like us. And so I think it's really important for folks to understand that and grapple with that a bit, that when you, tr when you trust and you have the type of relationships that we, 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 and we consistently try to have, that that's even another way of, of breaking out of the system in and of itself. You know, you're not doing this sort of complicated, convoluted due diligence process um, that a lot of investors and philanthropists utilize, but it's actually one that's really founded on trust and relationship. Thank you. Uh, there was a question in the chat box, Rodney, um, asking if you could talk a little bit more about what Common Future does. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for catching that, Kelly. So for many of you, you might remember Common Future as the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, otherwise known as Bali. Uh, so we've been around for quite some time. We rebranded and uh, sort of relaunched last uh, last winter or uh, so, uh, last year and sort of November, December timeline. And so we represent a network of about 150 or so um, practitioners that are really developing, I would say, alternative economic models, really building on um, economic models, business ownership models that really prioritize the interest of communities that have been historically impacted by injustice. Um, and that was not always the case for the organization. So I want to be clear about that, but that's where we are today. And so we also work with about uh, 45 local place-based foundations across the US and Canada, working with them to actually shift their endowment capital into what at, when I first came into the organization about two and a half years ago was principally around local. And so we still wanna maintain that local focus, but it's at, we're also trying to elevate the expectation that it's not just about local, it's also about what does the community actually need? And how are you actually leveraging your capital, your, your resources in ways that prioritize the needs of the community uh, particularly, again, those that have been historically um, um, sort of uh, left aside. And so one of the things that we've done uh, with COVID was actually be able to become more, much more of a conduit to our network to resor provide resources, financial resources um, to leaders in our network that have been remarkable and were particularly disproportionately impacted by uh, the implications of COVID, economic implications of, of, of COVID-19. And so you know, we were able to provide um, earlier this in April, or March rather, we put up 10% uh, of our operating budget to develop a, a um, rapid response fund. And one of the reasons why we did that 10% was actually we wanted to call in uh, philanthropists in particular who are doing their 5% payout on an annual basis, which is what is required from the IRS. And so we want to put a challenge out there to say, hey, if this relatively small nonprofit can do this, you know, can you demonstrate this capability as well. Can you also do this? Can you double your payout? Um, so we were able to do that. And, and then we did another uh, round of support to black led institutions in our network. And we're actually um, doing another round in the next week or so. Um, so, so effectively, we do a couple of things we su directly support as a kind of a financial conduit, the great work that's happening in our network, we also work with foundations and, and to degree high net worth individuals, but mostly foundations to actually move their capital in ways that you know, support the work of folks like Kelly and others um, that um, that we have, you know, that we're fortunate enough to have throughout all of our communities, but have gone under-recognized and unsupported. Thank you, Rodney. Um, Elise made a comment uh, in the chat box about spending so much time proving ourselves to funders and investors that, you know, we're, when you and I talked about this, Rodney, like feeling like we're bleeding for, for you know, for change, right? Like we're bleeding for um, a $5,000 grant. I have to, you know, how much per kid, per hour, per hair, you know, per per pasta dish, you know, <laughs> it, and, it, and it gets to the point where, you know, it, it feels like I, um, it feels more extractive to accept some funds than it does to, you know, just not have it, you know? Um, and that's a, that's a, 
symptom, I think, of unbalanced power as well. You know, if uh, if a funder is going to um, grant us fifty thousand dollars, but it's going to cost fifty thousand dollars just to get the impact that you want, you know, <laughs> it doesn't um, it doesn't make sense. Uh, I was sharing with you that the funders that act in on verba uplifts and um, really connects with and um, you know, gives all the props to are the funders that at the end of the year, at the end of the funding cycle say, tell us what happens, you know, tell us what happened. So, you know, how many kids got to do archery that's never done archery before? How many kids, um, you know, have enough money now to do those SAT prep courses and, um, you know, learn Latin and, and so on? We, we know that we have to start within the community and remind and tell kids that you know we're not really we have all this abundance in this country it's it's where it's going right <laughs> and that you need to raise your voice and say it needs to come here you know we deserve to have better food better air better um access to to the outdoors you know better health outcomes for with COVID-19 and and all the other things right so when we think about power at our organization, we're trying to make sure that we're starting with um, kids as young as five. If a kid as young as five don't qualify for our individual savings accounts, we restructure the whole program to make sure that they do. Um, I don't know if I have time for an example, but um, when, we, when we first started the farm and the IDA program, you know, I had to come up with a number, right? Like how many hours does a kid have to spend on a farm, on the farm in order to qualify for these um, accounts? And so the first number that came up, I, how much time do I spend here, right? And it was like a hundred hours, right? So the first uh, number was any kid that spent at least a hundred hours on the farm in a year were eligible for these savings accounts. In the last three years, we gathered up the staff and we talked about all the things that keep kids from coming to our farm for 100 hours, right? We talked about um, kids not having, you know, control over their transportation, you know, what was going on at school, you know, if it's a short day or a long day, you know, those kind of things. So when once we had that whole long conversation about the roadblocks, we restructured it and now it's, uh, it's 20 hours a year, right? So that even if a, a mom needs a break, wants to, and this is in a non-COVID year, wants to drop their child off at the farm, um, they, they're they racking up time, right? So they're eligible to share whatever the pot is at the end of the year. We think that's justice. We think that's equitable. We think that that's, um, that that makes sense for our community. And I wish that more I wish that more organizations and funders and investors that have that kind of power and insight could restructure their their programs similarly. Yeah, I think, think that's that's sort of I mean that's so true, and um, you know I think there's there's some good models. You know, there are good people um, that have really interrogated themselves maybe they've been challenged to interrogate themselves thanks to folks like you know i'm seeing i know folks will get to hear from quit out of capital and tiffany brown and um i know someone asked about restorative finance which is really something i think that conceptually has come from folks like amaka agbo um, and others I, one thing i would just point out is that when we talk about like power and wealth accum wealth accumulation is so central and even the fact of what you said kelly about like the impact metrics and measurements that people use um this is that is another expression of power right like why do funders and investors get to determine what in fact is success for a community that they're not a part of that they don't live in that they're not deeply in proximity to um you know i saw someone say like being in right relationship with the community so that's another expression of power and i think even like kelly what you're talking about like just determining what success looks like for you and then being able to say this is what success looks like right that's that in fact is something that is disrupting like the traditional power dynamic and so, you know, because there's been so much exploitation, because there's been so much taken away from communities continuously, um, and it's happening right now also, uh, people think it's in the past, that it's historic, but no, it's happening today. 
um, this idea of like, how do you store, uh, being restorative, dare I say even reparative, you know, how do you look at if, you know, my challenge to investors and funders is how do you not think about like your own accumulation, which again, furthers your own power, your own hold on things and instead share that power, you know, redistribute that power. And one way to do that is through redistributing capital, right? And not being so concerned about, you know, your own perpetuity if you're a foundation that is looking at lasting forever. Um, and how do you think about ways in which you can invest, uh, and I say invest holistically, that really is about building up the economic capacity and power of communities that have been most extracted and exploited, right? Um, and so that is sort of the thing that we think about at Common Future. How do we leverage our own resources? And then can we help others like model to do that? And of course, there are so many people that are in fact modeling this out. It's not as though it's only a few organizations or individuals, uh, but I do note that like for us, we really wanna be a Common Future. We want to be um, sort of a demonstration for what can happen if you're not focused solely on wealth accumulation when you're in fact are about power disruption. And so, I think that is something that I really want to challenge any investor or, found, uh, or funder or foundation to uh, really think about how you distribute power, how do you redistribute power, how do you put up your own wealth to actually ensure that communities are, are left whole and that you're in right relationship with communities. Thanks so much, Rodney. Um, it looks like we only have a couple more minutes before we're done. Did you have any anything to add before we leave or before we move on? Sorry, before we move on to the next part. I will, I will leave the last two minutes to you. I will see that to you, Kelly. Oh, thanks. <laughs> well, um, you know, I'm really excited to see all of the speakers today. I'm so um, honored to be one of the organizations that will be receiving the funds that you all uh, spent on your tickets. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna turn it over to 